Hey team, Mike here at After 40 Fitness, after40fitness.ca. Got a great one for you today. Great one on why the scale won't move. You know, this is one of those ones that comes up every day. And you probably, if you haven't yet experienced a stall in the scale moving, uh, then if it hasn't happened yet, it certainly will. Hey, listen, if this is your first time in my channel or if you haven't yet, uh, please do subscribe. Smash that like button for me if you enjoy this kind of content in the low-carb keto space. But uh, my goodness, subscribe. Putting out a couple of videos a week right now in this space. This is where I live along with you. And you'll know. You'll know whether tell if it's of interest to you. But this topic of the scale of stalling applies in two different two different scenarios. One is, of course, you've been in the keto or the Atkins space for a while. You'll lose 15, 20 pounds and all of a sudden the scale won't budge, right? That's obviously commonplace. Everybody experiences a stall. It's, it's just the body's way of rebelling, right? If you will, against a caloric deficit. We'll talk about that. But number two is people will say the scale hasn't, hasn't budged. I still weigh the same a week into keto or Atkins, but uh, oh my God, like I've lost an inch in my waist or I've lost half an inch on my thighs. How does that happen, right? We're gonna talk about that today. All right, so those are the two ways, the two scenarios around why the scale isn't budging. We're going to focus on them. I think you're like this. Ten reasons why the scale isn't budging despite the fact you're seeing other improvements. Let's get after it. Number one, let's get the ball rolling with sleep or rather inconsistent sleep or insomnia. Uh, poor sleep easily, you must know this, can add a pound or two of water in the form of water retention, of bloating, of swelling, of edema. Um, I, in fact, try not to weigh in on days where I didn't get a good night's sleep the night before. If I didn't get eight plus hours, I'm not weighing in uh, because sleep has such an impact on so many hormonal functions. It determines whether we're anabolic or catabolic. Digestion, uh, cortisol, I don't know if you know this or not, but not getting enough sleep increases our cortisol response, which primary function is to help us store weight and or retain water. Uh, I want to show you a quick study on this topic. Uh, I found this in the Annals of Internal Medicine. The title was Insufficient Sleep Undermines Dietary Efforts to Reduce Adiposity or Fat Loss. It undermines our efforts to get lean. And you'll notice 14 days of a moderate, moderate caloric de uh, restriction, which they said was about a 30% deficit in calories across both groups, whether they got eight and a half hours of sleep or they were restricted to five and a half hours of sleep, right? and they wanted to see what the result was. Notice sleep curtailment, or in other words, dropping down to five and a half hours of sleep, decreased the fraction, fraction of weight lost as fat by half, by half. In 14 days, if you only got five and a half hours of sleep, your, your fat loss was half. Notice 1.4 kilograms, by the way, for you Americans, just double that by two. Yeah, you just double, double it by two, double it, and you'll get the, the amount in pounds. So those that got eight and a half hours of sleep lost right around three pounds right around three pounds in the same amount of time that those who got five and a half hours of sleep only lost 0.6 kilograms or roughly 1.2, maybe 1.3 pounds. What a difference. Well, if, if that's the case, notice the next line, an increase in the loss of fat-free mass. Now, fat-free mass isn't just muscle, but it includes muscle and 60% more. And notice 1.5 kilograms, so let's call it three pounds of muscle loss. So even, even though they got enough sleep, they still lost muscle three pounds in the eight and a half hours per night group. But notice it doubled the 2.4. Let's call that, well, you can just double that to five pounds lost in, this, in the intervention group. Now, you know what I find is most often when people go keto or Atkins, guess what they first, in the first month, guess what they talk about? Insomnia. I don't know about you, I had it bad. I, for like 10 days, could not get a full night's sleep. I was up at two, I was up at six. Had a hard time falling back to sleep and then, you know, oh my God, brutal. Like remarkable how much of an impact our sleep. So if you think for a second that you're, you know, you're impacted by this keto insomnia or Atkins insomnia and you can't understand why the scale isn't moving in the first 10 days, two weeks, sleep is a big variable. Big. Number two is for the ladies. You know all about it, your menstrual cycle. Live Strong said that the average person can fluctuate their fluid uh, on a daily basis yeah, by four pounds, by about four pounds. And yet, uh, women, you know this better than anybody, that week, that 10 days, both both premenstrual and the beginning days of your menstrual cycle, uh, I don't have to tell you, uh, but oh my God, two to five pounds seems to be the norm for most women. Uh, many times my boot camp ladies will say to me, you know, the scale hasn't budged for them. It, they don't follow my advice and they measure more often or scale themselves more often than once a month. Uh, man, they'll say, hey, I'm following your diet plan, Mike, I'm coming to boot camps and I'm still not losing a whole lot of weight. I'll say, what's changed? And guess what they'll say? Nothing. I'll say, well, what do you do? What do you do? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my God. I'm either like in that pre-week or it's the first couple of days. Oh, my God. Come on now. Hello. 
So obviously, women more than men need to understand that hormonal balance and water retention, man, that's that they go hand in hand. In fact, I'll show you really quickly a cool study on this really fast. Characterizations, this one was in the Internal uh, Women's Health, Journal of Women's Health. Uh, characterization of symptoms and edema distribution in premenstrual syndrome. Okay, symptoms and edema, of course, being swelling and water retention. And what they did in this study, really cool, 60 women. And they were evaluated in their premenstrual days, right, 21 through 28, and the first three days of their menstrual cycle. Collected all these measurements and metrics, body mass, et cetera, I won't go into the details. But 65% of them had visible swelling. Also, anxiety, 58%, 60%. Well, that increases cortisol right there, So, uh, which, of course, Cortisol is anti-weight loss. Right? It promotes insulin, which promotes fat loss, uh, fat gain. So all in all, women, you got a tough go. Roughly about 10 days a very month, let's call it one third of the month, your hormones, your body's fighting you. Uh, I'm right back to you. You should weigh the first of every month as long as it's not that 10 days. Hope that makes sense. Guys, thank God we don't have this one. That's all I can say. Woo-wee, women, you can have it. Number three is digestion. And by digestion, I gotta be careful how I wear that because I don't mean digestion in the form of your stomach. I mean like colon. I mean like how much, when was the last time you went for a dump and eliminated? Um, so I'll tell you something. If you haven't crapped in, let's say the, the 24 to 48 hours prior to a weigh-in, don't weigh in, right? You're storing somewhere between five and 10 pounds is easily done in the size of our colon of uneliminated food. Uh, pre precisely, again, why I don't like using the scale as a measurement at all because that's what you're weighing. You're weighing water weight. You're weighing uneliminated food. Uh, sometimes <clears throat> as we diet down and as our calories drop and as we our food volume drops uh, and then of course we, we probably throw in intermittent fasting in some way shape or form whether naturally or on purpose as a, a fasting methodology. Well guess what? Um, we're now dropping down to a shortened window, less food, we slow our digestion down which is something we want to do on purpose and so much less food to process, so much less food to eliminate means often it backs up. Right? If our body is used to a certain amount of volume and we eat less, our body may just counter and say, I'm gonna wait until it gets to a certain mass before you eliminate. So again, the scale, not a fan of it, but if you're going to use it, just understand that, hey, uh, was your sleep good and did you eliminate in the last 24 hours? Number four is water intake, and not just water intake, but consistent water intake, fluid intake. Uh, in this regard, unless you're dehydrated, it doesn't even appear to matter how much you drink, it's more consistency that matters than anything else. A consistent amount is easy for the body to regulate. Sodium and potassium do their job to make sure that you are exactly on point with your hydration when that amount of water is consistent. The science supports, unless you're working out heavily or in the heat, 60 ounces seems to be the perfect amount. Everyone seems to be hydrated at 60 until they enter in. Uh, exercise and heat. So if you're doing those things, you can up to 70 or 80, but that's the science. Um, what matters more though is consistency. Consistency is better than fluctuations, even if those fluctuations are on the high side. So if you're going to either decrease or increase your water intake, expect for a couple of days some fluid retention as your body equalizes or comes to a new equilibrium, but do your best to, to make sure that A, you're hydrated. Hydrated is good. And again, 60 ounces appears to be enough, proven to be enough. Uh, and beyond that, don't think for a second that anyone ever lost a pound of fat. Uh, listen to me, no one ever lost a pound of fat by drinking more water, right? Make no mistake, fat is fat soluble, which means water has no impact on it. So when someone says you drink half your body weight in ounces or drink a gallon a day, good. If you want to, do it. Don't think for a second you have to and don't think for a second it's mandatory. Number five is food choices. Right? Your choices in food should be foods that digest well if you're going to use the scale. Ingesting foods that cause you digestive uh, uh, grief, uh, that bog down your system, that you can't process and or eliminate well, uh, that'll just exacerbate your stall. I promise you, it'll cause A, it'll cause you stress, uh, which further releases cortisol, such a vicious cycle. But many of these foods will hold water. Uh, even if they're complex carbs, make no mistake, even carbs, as you know, hold water and so do complex carbs. So to add insult to injury, green veggies, especially raw greens, cruciferous vegetables, A, they're hard to digest. Make no mistake, they are so good for us. They're so good. There's so many phytonutrients, etc., in them, but they all cause bloating and inflammation when being digested. Right? You got to be clear on that. There's good and bad, and vegetables are not designed to be digested by us, and so they fight back a little bit, which causes digestion and often inflammation in the gut, which holds water. Oh my God, so good for us though. But digesting them is problematic. So uh, here, I'll tell you, tell you what, if you have any carnivore friends, ask them. Ask them what happened to their digestion and their water retention when they cut out vegetables. It's remarkable. But just be aware of that, okay? Just be aware of that, especially when you go keto and you decide to eat healthy and you up your cruciferous, uh, that's gonna hold water in the gut. 
in your inflammation in, in your entire intestinal tract, be aware of it. Number six, sodium. And again, when it comes to sodium, consistency is the key. Not, not super low one day and then high the next. Fluctuations in sodium, you have to be clear, will cause fluctuations on the scale. Remarkable. Another one of those topics that we often don't think about, but it, we have to make sure our sodium is not only a little bit higher than normal when we were followers of a SAD, but consistent. The leaner I get, the more precise I need to be. I was gonna, almost said anal, but the more precise I need to be about being consistent with water and sodium, uh, I'm on the high end. I fully endorse sodium in the, call it two to five gram range, two on the low side, so 2,000 milligrams. I personally aim for four to 5,000 milligrams uh, on a regular daily basis. And I make sure between all my food intake, my straight rem and red that I down with my ACV, I make sure I'm in the four to five gram per day range. And, and at four to five grams, it's remarkable, not this new research is out and with Dr. Finney's endorsement of at least four grams a day as being prime for those Atkins and keto, I find that I'm, I'm leaner, I'm more vascular, but if I drop that value in half for some reason, or something that's very high in sodium, I'll notice that the next day I'm less vascular. I'll notice less, the next day I'm puffier. So to me, I say, uh, my recommendation, again, not being a doctor, just being a boot camp coach and a keto coach is don't fear sodium. And if you are seeing fluctuations or not, you know, a lack of movement on the scale, have a look at your sodium and see if it's fluctuating on a daily basis and try to level it out. It'll help you, promise you. Number seven is alcohol. And I don't mind telling you I'm torn on alcohol. I understand the need to be social. Uh, I understand that some of you have a, a frequent need to be social. I, on the other hand, like to weigh that against goals and the need to sacrifice to hit them, to reach them. So alcohol has got um, some inherent issues. I think you know about them. Uh, if you ingest some, you know you need extra water, right? I think everyone knows that alcohol has a, has a bit of a, a dehydrating effect. And so are there benefits? Yeah, I think if you, if you look at red wine in particular, I don't have any benefits other than red wine, but at least the, the resveratrol in the skin of red grapes, we know there's a benefit as far as longevity goes and heart health, antioxidant value. Otherwise, not so much, right? It purely, it's not called a vice for no reason. So I think that I, I do my best to drink like a special occasion, which is typically once or twice a year. I think it's been at least a year since the last time I personally had alcohol. Interestingly, uh, you know, based on the dehydration effect of alcohol, that the next morning after I've had a couple of drinks, those couple of times, the last time I recall, uh, I kid you not, man, I look harder, I look leaner, I look vascular the next morning. And so that's definitely the dehydration effect. And you know, what I noticed is that by the end of that day, uh, oh my God, I'm not, I'm no longer lean, I'm now puffier, I'm up a pound or two of water, because man, getting that water in you, if it dehydrates you, believe me, your body's going to compensate. And so that's not a time to weigh. And number eight is stress. Oh my God, it's so important that we reduce our stress. You know, just what everything we've talked about so far in the first seven, it, it contributes to our stress. Uh, our job is to make sure that we remove it as many as possible. You know, so I'm just using the scale is stressful. Man, I read some of the comments on social media on a daily basis and people freak out about the scale. Uh, what you need to know is that cortisol it impacts just about every cell in our body. Just about every cell in our body has a cortisol receptor. So if cortisol is high due to stress, whether acute or chronic, our cells are gonna hold on to more water. In fact, cortisol directly impacts something called our ADH. Uh, this is our antidiuretic hormones, also known as vasopressin, but there's a good diagram of it. And it influences our water retention levels based on cortisol, based on stress, how much gets directed to intra and extracellular water versus to urine. So guess what? best thing you can do obviously to improve your stress is get better sleep right we wake up with less cortisol and less cortisol responses throughout the day uh, when it comes to supplements the one that's just so profound in this area is ashwagandha uh, i don't know of a sup that's better designed by nature to reduce our cortisol not just reduce our cortisol but also our body's response to cortisol uh, just so you know diet alone being in a caloric deficit i just did a video on can calories get too low? And I'll link that down below if you're curious, but they did a test on cortisol for people after baseline who went on a calorie restricted diet and their level of cortisol was in direct proportion to the amount of their caloric deficit. So as they went from a mild to a moderate to an extreme caloric deficit, their cortisol went up. The body's mechanism of fighting a caloric deficit. So don't think for a second that you are stress-free or cortisol-free if you live the, a high life and, and you're still in a caloric deficit. That's not the case. So again, just something else that uh, impacts our, our fluid retention, our ability to lose weight. And if you want to know why the scale isn't budging, even if the tape is getting smaller and you're seeing improvements in your measurements, stress is a big player. 
Number nine, believe it or not, is potassium. You know how we talked about sodium already? Well, potassium plays a, an equal role in cellular fluid balance to sodium. In fact, it's the other side of the coin. It's the flip side of the coin from sodium. Uh, remember, sodium is all about incoming water, about getting water into the cells and keeping it there. Potassium does the opposite. Potassium is all about pumping it out, about releasing it. It's vital that we get enough potassium to, to pump out play opposite to the sodium and, and pump out the fluids so we don't retain it, look soft, get puffy, have edema. When it comes to potassium, the RDA is, it's actually a range, it's really weird. It's the only one that has a range. It's from 3,500 milligrams to 4,700 milligrams. So you have to fit somewhere that I call it four grams. There is some fear around too much. If you do some research though on what too much potassium looks like, for a healthy individual who doesn't have kidney or liver damage, uh, then somewhere between 12 and 15 grams seems to be as much as you need to take in before potassium becomes too much, uh, but you need to really overdo it. So when we're talking about two or three grams a day, and again, I'm not a doctor, do your own research, talk to your GP about it, but it would appear that two or three grams a day has nothing but benefits to you and I, and our water retention levels, our fluid balance will appreciate it. And number 10, are you working out? See, if you're working out, especially as a newbie, there's this thing called newbie gains, and I'll tell you, they're a real thing. You can gain more muscle in your first three to six weeks, your first couple, three months of working out than veterans can make in a year. I mean, guess what? That means the scale might not even stay flat. It might actually go up a bit with that new increase in muscle synthesis. And trust me, that's a damn good thing. Right, you want that. Uh, so I, again, ask those who are complaining of a stall, what's your workout regimen like? If you're a new lifter, a new, you know, new to resistance training or hit, or if you're infrequent then, but have been lifting of late, well, a, booyah, you're winning, but B, that's reflected in the scale. I've seen uh, new clients who work out really hard. They, they really dedicate themselves, and I mean work out hard, uh, both diet and exercise, and for a good two to three month period, they only lose a, a couple pounds, but man, they look dramatically different. Big improvements in body composition. You wouldn't know it by the scale. So a killer workout, uh, especially as a newbie, but a killer workout even for veterans, can induce this thing Called, um, called DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. Delayed onset muscle soreness is soreness the next day, and trust me, it's inflammation. When you're tender or sore to the touch, that's inflammation. That's the body dealing with that stress of a good, good, solid, intense workout, and that, that packs a lot of water. That volumizes a lot of water, and I've, I personally have seen myself do a leg workout and the next day weigh two pounds more just from water retention. Okay, so if you're working out, trust me, such a good thing. There are so many health benefits to working out. Don't sweat the scale, especially in the first three months of a keto or Atkins program if you're also working out. So there you have it. 10 possible contributors, 10 possible variables that may impact why the scale isn't moving, but perhaps measurements are, or there's other noticeable ways that you can tell that you're in a caloric deficit, that you're improving body composition, and yet the scale won't play along. Yeah. Okay, I hope that helped. If you can think of any others or have any questions about the 10, please put a comment down below. The best comments I turn into videos just like this one, so make them good. But on that note, listen, last comment, that means the scale really isn't a viable way of measuring your success. The tape measure is far better, but as is any kind of a, a caliper test for body fat composition, a DEXA scan, if your local gym or university will uh, provide DEXA scans. I'm very partial to with my clients using the calipers, the fat calipers. I'll show you a quick little picture of them here. And just by taking measurements in four or five, six different places, as little as three places actually on the body, I can tell the client their, their fat percentage, because to me, body fat percentage is also a much better indicator of your improvement in fat composition. All you care about is losing fat, right? You don't care about losing water. You definitely don't want to lose muscle. So I think that's a, a good contributing factor is knowing your body fat composition and using it as your gauge, not your relative relationship to, to, uh, to gravity. So on that note, I appreciate your time. And uh, again, drop a question. Don't forget to hit that like button for me. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. I'll see you in the next one.